Hi, my name is Darren Lapomi. I'm a professor of nanoengineering at UC San Diego. What is a professor? Whenever I get the question, what do you do? And I say, I'm a professor. Invariably, the next thing that the person says is, what do you teach? And at a big research university like University of California, San Diego, the professors do a lot of things of which teaching is only one. So maybe a third of our time is spent teaching and another um, good chunk of time, probably more than a third, probably 40 or 50 percent of our time is spent doing research. And in the research lab, we have a topic, uh, could be a topic within chemistry or physics or nanoengineering in my case, and we have graduate students and postdocs. So those are MS students, PhD students, and then postdocs. Postdocs is li are like a, uh, an academic residency. So in medicine, people have specialized training. Same thing happens in, uh, in academia. Those people are called postdocs. And we train those students and postdocs in the lab to do various, uh, various things. And a, a lot of my time is spent mentoring them and uh, working on papers with them and presenting my results at conferences. How did I know I wanted to be a professor? I have wanted to do a lot of things in life. For example, when I was in high school, I was really interested in music. In fact, I uh, auditioned at some pretty competitive music schools on the trombone. I didn't get into any of them. Uh, it's probably a good thing I didn't get into any of them because I'm better at science than I am at music, although I do play the piano pretty much every day, which is something that I've uh, done since I was about six years old. Becoming a professor wasn't something that I wanted to do every day starting when I got to college. Um, there were times when I wanted to go into business. There were even times when I wanted to do a startup company. There were times when I wanted to run a restaurant and have live music. <laughs> and ultimately what I decided is that my resume ended up looking like it was a professor's resume and I ended up applying to a bunch of positions. I applied to 28 positions, I got seven interviews, and I got one offer. So I actually had six rejections in a row before I finally got the uh, the offer letter from UC San Diego and I'm very glad to be here now. What is a typical day like? There is no such thing as a typical day for a professor. My days consist of writing grants, giving presentations, teaching, mentoring students one-on-one, -on -one, so meeting with them about their research, going to committee meetings, doing service jobs, and by service jobs I mean when a paper is submitted by a professor and their students at another university, it gets sent to another professor at another university to review for its scientific quality. So that is one uh, that's called peer review, and that's one of the things that, uh, that I do. I did that this morning, for example. I do a lot of outreach activities. So I have a lot of videos on YouTube and podcast episodes. I'm really interested in video production comes from being like a sci-fi nerd and uh, someone who's been interested in uh, in movies for a long time. When I was a kid, I used to have my uncle tape the show on the Discovery Channel called Movie Magic because we didn't have cable at home. The nice thing about being a professor is that I don't have a boss. I have a department chair who can change my teaching assignments and I have a dean who is sort of like a boss but can't really tell you what research you need to do but they are in charge of things like allocation of space and resources and uh, to a lesser extent teaching but to a large extent I get to decide what to do with my time. On the flip side, there are a lot of people that, a lot of people and organizations that can ask me to do a lot of things. For example, when I get an invitation to uh, review an article for a journal, um, I'm not obligated to do it, but I do have to do a certain number of them every year. 
Same thing with grant reviews. So it takes a lot of money to run a research group. Um, for example, it takes about $800,000 uh, to run my research group uh, per year. So uh, when other professors apply for grants, people uh, like me and my, uh, my colleagues and professors at other universities get together in, a, in committees uh, or uh, study sections and they review these grants and provide comments and the ones that get the highest scores tend to be the ones that get funded. So there is a, uh, a large number of, so while I have control over my own schedule, there is a large number of people who have legitimate demands on my time, but overall it's a fair trade. What is nanoscience? Nanoscience is a lot of things. Nanoscience to me involves the discovery and utilization of materials and phenomena that occur on length scales of 100 nanometers or less. So what's 100 nanometers? 100 nanometers is about one one hundredth of the diameter of one of the hairs on the top of your head. So the hair on your head might be 10 micrometers or microns all the way up to maybe 100 mi uh, micrometers or microns. Probably not 100, probably closer to, uh, to 10. Um, and one nanometer is about 10 times the, uh, the diameter of an atom. So we're talking about things that are pretty small. When you get down to this scale, a lot of very interesting effects emerge. For example, nanostructures can interact with light in ways that other structures do not. Uh, for example, a uh, you might have gone to an electronics store and seen something called a QLED display, which is a quantum dot um, enabled uh, uh, light emitting device. It's actually a quantum dot enabled liquid crystal display that has a sheet of quantum dots in it. And the quantum dots absorb some of the light coming from the light bulb in the back of the display and then they convert that energy into a spectrum which is more pleasing to the eye and looks, uh, looks better. So that's one example of a nano-enabled technology. Another example is the carbon composite materials that make up composite aircraft components. Take the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, for example, where the components are made of plastic mixed with carbon nanomaterials that give you an exceptional strength and, uh, and ability and, and light weight, uh, which really saves on fuel economy and also allows you to, to pressurize the, um, the cabin with, uh, that is the interior of the plane, with moisture so it's more comfortable to take a long flight. Other examples of nanotechnology in the news recently are mRNA vaccines. So mRNA vaccines, if you just inject the M mRNA directly into the body, they will be hydrolyzed very quickly. So what you have is a lipid nanoparticle, which is a type of fat molecule that forms a nanoparticle that helps um, evade the immune system, bond with cells, and, uh, and protect the, uh, the precious cargo inside. So nanotechnology is used all the time in biomedical applications. What do you need to know to be a nanoscientist? Well, the good thing is that you don't need to know anything. You need to be really curious. And if your subjects like chemistry and physics and biology are really interesting to you or you have a passion for those, there are definitely places where those disciplines intersect with nanotechnology. And I gave some examples in aircraft and mRNA vaccines, but there are also applications in microelectronics. That's a big one. So basically all display technologies, all microchips, are nano enabled in some way or another. So in fact, the way that a microprocessor or a, or a memory chip is fabricated at a factory, you go through probably up to 50 layers of nano fabrication. You're basically building up a little city on these silicon chips 
that, uh, that contain devices like capacitors and transistors and resistors that ultimately become the, uh, the, the integrated circuit that goes in your computer or your smartphone. What do I work on? So my research is on the mechanical properties of plastic semiconductor materials. And let me give you an example of what I mean by plastic semiconductor material. Um, oh yeah, I wasn't planning this, but this is a good, uh, a good example. So what I have here are solar cells that are, uh, that are made of plastic. And this one has been uh, crumpled. It doesn't work very well uh, right now. But uh, these, uh, this red material that you can see here, that's a plastic semiconductor. This particular one was made by, uh, by a group in Denmark that we, uh, that we collaborate with. And the problem is when you are making these solar panels on, uh, in a process that involves roll-to-roll -roll printing like you would print newspaper or a magazine or something these materials are very fragile so they tend to to pull apart let me find uh, an example here that uh, yeah so here's a good one so this material here the semiconducting layer actually sort of behaves like the glue or you want it to behave like glue otherwise you can peel it right apart like i have here so the better your material is as a semiconductor, the worse it tends to be as a physical, uh, physically strong material that can bind these devices together. So that's a problem we're trying to solve. We're also using some of the same types of, of scientific approaches to make plastic semiconducting materials that can interface with the human body to measure physiological quantities like pulse respiration um, and also we're interested in using these materials to uh, to produce a uh, tactile effect so you could go into virtual reality and have these materials communicate with your skin so that you can do, for example, surgical training or physical therapy in a way that didn't involve uh, operating on a real patient or going into the doctor. So because of the COVID-19 pandemic, people have been uh, utilizing telehealth services. So all of my doctor's appointments in the last 10 years <laughs> 10 months, 12 months, uh, have been by, by, uh, by telehealth. Um, and if you could introduce some other form of interaction, say by using tactile effects, you might be able to do, uh, to do a lot, uh, a lot better. So that is a brief snapshot of the kind of stuff that we, uh, that we work on in the lab. And now I'll give you a little tour of the lab. Welcome to the lab tour. This is the hallway in the Structural and Materials Engineering Building at UC San Diego. It houses the nanoengineering department on the second and third floor and structural engineering on the third and fourth floor. This is one of our two labs. It's sort of like the wet lab um, and materials processing lab. On the right hand side, we have instruments called gel permeation chromatography systems, which give you the weight or the sizes of molecules in solution. Uh, sort of typical chemistry equipment. That's a distiller called a rotavap that uh, draws solvent off. That's a chemical fume hood. This is a physical vapor deposition system. It heats up metals really hot and deposits thin films, almost like a spray can. Um, this is a glove box where we do some of our uh, solar cell measurement uh, techniques and that's a quartz uh, floor in the bottom of that where the light shines up through to measure the solar cells it simulates the sun this is another chemical fume hood where we do materials processing uh, here is some bench space and then no science lab is complete without a compound microscope and here's uh, here's ours <laughs> And over here is the uh, plasma cleaner, which oxidizes thin films of organics. This is a snorkel hood that draws 
uh, toxic uh, <laughs> solvent vapors up, for example, produced by that uh, UV curing uh, station that uh, is the same kind that's actually used in a nail salon. Now we go down two doors to the next lab and our lab has about half of the space on the right hand side of this lab and this is where we do a lot of dry processing and uh, anal uh, analysis so that is a um, gas permeability apparatus so we can measure the transport of molecules through thin films particularly of the material known as graphene these instruments over here are designed to uh, to measure the uh, the electronic properties of materials. That's a mechanical testing apparatus on the left. That is a semiconductor parameter analyzer. Uh, and then this is kind of like the machine shop corner. I went in there on a day like right before labs clean up and uh, so it's a little bit of a mess. This area here is um, the a uh, couple of 3D printers, that's a UV ozone cleaner, um, and uh, UV vis spectroscopy. Uh, here's uh, a safety shower, which you might have seen in your high school lab. Thanks very much for joining me on the tour, and I hope you learned something from this video. Take care.